Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Uh, today we're looking at a data set of some historical sales and active inventory. So sort of like two data sets in one. You have um, a bunch of historical and active uh, products in here. And we're actually just going to be using the historical section of the data, of the data frame um, because we want to try to predict the sold flag, which is whether or not uh, a given product has been sold in the last six months. Uh, so that's what we're going to try to predict based on the other features. <clears throat> and the reason we're only using historical um, is because the active records do not have sold flag associated with them. So um, let's hop into the notebook. We're going to use NumPy and Pandas for working with the data. Uh, we're also going to use Kfold for evaluating the model today. And for pre-processing, we'll use the one-hot encoder and standard scaler from sklearn. We'll also be using a column transformer, pipeline, uh, and the random oversampler. Uh, these two from sklearn and this random oversampler from imblearn, because we're going to try to address the class imbalance with that. For a model, we'll use a random forest classifier, and we'll evaluate it using an accuracy score and F1 score. Uh, it's important to use F1 score when you're dealing with the class imbalance. So let's go ahead and import all of these, and we're going to load in the data using pandas.readcsv. I'll get the file path to the CSV file up here, just copy that in, and we can take a look. Alright, also look at data.info, so we can see uh, any missing values and data types of the columns. And it looks like the only missing values are contained here, and that's like how I said uh, these two columns, sold flag and sold count, will only have values uh, when we are dealing with a historical record. When, we're, when we have an active record, they'll have missing values. All right, so let's uh, start pre-processing. So here uh, I'm going to build a create a function called preprocess inputs. Uh, and that's going to take in a data frame, and for now all it's going to do is copy it over. So we'll return the same data frame after it's been copied, and we'll store that in X. Uh, so we'll pass in data. Now X is just a copy of data, but this is the copy that we'll do the uh, the actual preprocessing on. So the first thing to do is to get only the historical records. So we can do that with the query function, x.query. Uh, look for all examples where file type equals historical. Um, and here you can see we now only have historical records. So we still have 75,000 rows. We're, we're not doing too badly. And if we check the missing values of this uh, with isna.sum, you can see we have no missing values. However, if we change this to active, we'll have all missing values in these two. So historical is what we want. And we don't need to see the sum anymore. Uh, so this is the part of the data we like. So let's go up and say df equals that thing. Just change x to df. Uh, so this will effectively drop all of the active records. So only use uh, historical data. Okay, now next thing we'd like to do is drop unused columns. So there's some columns in here we don't need. So let's look at X again. Um, for example, the order number. This is just a unique identifier. We definitely don't need this here. So let's go df equals df dot drop uh, order. We're going to drop the order column. And we're dropping from axis 1, which is the column axis. All right, what else do we need? SKU number, this is also a unique identifier for each one. Um, sold flag and sold count. Now, this is an interesting one. Um, the sold count here is, we have to drop it. And the reason is, we're trying to predict the sold flag, but the sold flag is actually a function of sold count. What I mean is, uh, the value assigned to the sold flag column comes from the sold count column. If there's at least one sold for the sold count column, then we have a one in the sold flag column. Otherwise, if we have zero, then we have a zero in the sold flag column. So uh, this is basically giving away the answer to our target uh, data, our, tar our target column. Um, so in practice, if you were to use this model, you wouldn't need to um, ever predict sold flag if you already had sold count available to you. The reason we'd want this model is because we don't have sold count available to us, and maybe we want to know how a future product might uh, sell, or whether or not it will sell. Um, on the other hand, we could also turn this into some sort of regression task and try to predict the sold count, 
and then in which case we would drop the sold flag. But for today we're going to be predicting sold flag, so I'm dropping the sold count column. Okay. Next is marketing type. That seems fine. Release number. This one uh, is a little interesting. It's hard to say if this is numeric, like an ordinal feature, or if this is, uh, in, if these are independent of each other. This could be some sort of like category of all releases, or it could also be like the number released. So, you know, it doesn't say anything in the description here. Um, so I'm not really sure. What what I'll do in that case is I'll try both. First, I'll try just leaving it as numeric, and then I'll switch it to uh, a one hot encoding and see if we get better results that way. For the new release flag, um, this is fine. This is just saying if it's a new release or not. Uh, strength factor, this is also numeric, and I think all the rest are numeric as well. Yeah. So only one we're going to one hot encode here would be our marketing type. And actually, we should check the number of unique values in that. So we can take the marketing type column and look at the unique values with dot unique. And there's actually only two. So this is actually, this can just, this can just be binary encoded. We'll send D to uh, like 0, S to 1, and that will take care of the column for us. Um, However, because we also might want to one-hot encode the release number, I'm going to do that same thing using a one-hot encoder. So if you're unfamiliar with one-hot encoding, it basically just generates dummy columns for a given uh, column. So if we pass in marketing type here, it will send each unique value to its own column, and a 1 represents the original value of that example. However, if you're doing a binary uh, variable like this, which means it only has two unique values, then one of these columns is redundant. So in this case, we'd probably want to drop S like that and just use this as the encoding. So this is what we're going to do. Uh, we're actually going to use a sklearn one hot encoder to just do that automatically for us. So everything else is good. Uh, another thing I realized, we don't need the file type anymore. Because they're all historical now, we're just going to drop uh, file type also. Uh, actually, it comes after. just want to preserve the order here. Okay, and this is about right. Oh, we forgot to drop SKU number. So that goes here. Okay, I think everything else is good. Uh, all right, let us, so I guess we'll split the data. It's the last thing to do. Oh, we want to get a Y. So we're going to split the data frame into X and Y. Y is going to be what we're trying to predict, and that would be this old flag column. And uh, X is all the rest of the data. So we'll drop the sold, sold flag column from axis 1. And then let's return X and Y. Oh, we need to get them back properly over here. There's X, there's Y. Um, and good. Okay, so. We're going to build our pipeline now. And the pipeline will take care of the pre-processing for us and then also uh, perform predi make predictions. So let's create a function called build pipeline that'll do this for us. Um, and so this is going to start by creating the one hot encoder. So this is a one hot encoder object from sklearn. This will just do exactly what uh, I showed before with the dummies function. However, we're going to embed this in its own pipeline. And it's a pipeline that whose only step is a one hot encoding. So like like so. Now, I'm going to call this nominal transformer. I'm also going to include in here sparse equals false so we don't get a sparse output. And this is important uh, drop equals if binary. So this is the part that's going to drop that extra dummy column for the binary variable. So if it detects that the column only has two unique values, it'll drop one of the columns for us. Um, yeah, and so after we have our nominal transformer, we're going to embed it in a column transformer object, which uh, this object from sklearn 
allows us to specify which columns we'd like to target with a transformer. So we pass in which, uh, the list of transformers we have in here and separate, uh, make them each uh, in a tuple with a name and a, an object. So in this case, we'll call it nominal and it's just gonna be our nominal transformer. And then we get to specify which columns we want to apply it to. In this case, it's just marketing type but we're going to go back in later and do the same thing for uh, release number and see if we get better results that way. Another thing to note, we should be include here remainder equals pass through. What that does um, is basically uh, by default, any columns that were not targeted by the column transformer will just be dropped from the data frame. So if we keep remainder equals pass through, then they'll pass through along with the transformed columns as well. We'll call this preprocessor, and now we're going to build the model. So the model is a pipeline whose steps are the following. It has a preprocessor to start. That's just the preprocessor we defined. And then it has our regressor. Now, if we weren't doing random forest today, which we are, so it's a random forest classifier. Um, if we weren't doing random forest, we would want to scale the data right in here. We put a scaler in there. But we're not scaling because tree models do not need to be scaled. Um, in here, I'm also going to include a random state so we can reproduce the results. And then we're just going to return model from this function. So this function builds our whole model for us, pre-processing and all. Um, and then we're going to start training and validating. So we're doing this simultaneously as we use kfold cross-validation. So the idea behind kfold, um, if you're not familiar, is basically uh, this, this image right here. You have multiple runs, uh, and each time you use a different section of the data as your test set. So uh, this is a, a four-fold cross-validation, where you have four different folds, uh, which means you've split the data, data set into four different sections. And for each run, uh, you use one a different section as the test set, and all the other sections as the train set. So the reason we do this is because if we just picked one test set, imagine we're just doing run one, we pick this as our test set, uh, it's, we, we could have a highly variable performance. Um, it's because this is a very, this, this section of the data might not be representative of the whole thing or representative of the data generating process that gave us this data in the first place. So what we do is we use all sex, sections of the data um, to analyze, we build a new model each time, and then we'll take the average uh, score across all of them to get a sort of more general sense of how the model's doing. So um, to do this, we're going to use uh, a kfold object from sklearn. So kfold, and we specify n splits in here um, to be five. So that was a fourfold validation. We're gonna do a fivefold, which is fairly standard. You could do five or 10, it really doesn't matter so much as long as it's not uh, too high or too low. Um, so we're gonna call this KF. And one more thing I realized, um, we should actually go up here and we should shuffle the data before we start this. Because uh, KFold won't shuffle for us, it's just gonna split at even intervals. So it's, it's sort of expecting that it's been shuffled beforehand. So shuffle data, for this we can just take DF and call the sample function on it sampling 100% of the data, so that's fraction equals 1.0, and we'll give it a random state so we, we, we can reproduce the shuffle. All right, so now it's been shuffled, uh, and we're ready for this. So we have our kfold object. Now, the kf.split function is very nice. Um, we, we split and pass in our data, and what it does is creates a generator that will generate trained indices and test indices for us. Um, so for train index and test index in this kf.split thing, let's print out the test index. Uh, so here's the first runs test index, here's the second runs, the third runs, the fourth runs, and the fifth runs. And you can see each time it picks up where it left off. So this is the split that we saw in that picture before. Um, and every time we have a test index, all the other sections are being used as train, uh, train data. Okay, so uh, 
instead of printing it, what we're going to do is we're going to sort of just create our x train, x test, y train, and y test sections of the data. x train will be x indexed at the train index and all columns. x test is x indexed at the test index, targeting all columns. y train is y indexed at the train index. And that's just one dimensional, so we don't need to specify the columns there. And y test is y indexed at the test index. So that will just set up our uh, our sections there. And then what we'll do is create a new model each time using the build pipeline function that we created. Once we have the model, we're going to fit it on the train set, x train, y train. Then we'll get the accuracy and F1 scores for the model. So we'll create a set of predictions, ypred, using model.predict on the test set. We'll calculate an accuracy score um, using accuracy score. And I'm going to pass in ytest and ypred. And then we'll calculate an F1 score using F1 score. These are both functions from sklearn here. Passing in ytest and ypred. And it's also setting the positive label to uh, 1.0, which is uh, the positive class uh, in here. So if we look at y.value counts, you can see this flag takes either value of 0 0.0 or 1.0. 1.0 is positive, that means that the item was sold, and that's also the minority. So when you're doing um, when you're doing this sort of imbalanced class problem, you can see there's quite quite a few more zero examples than there are one examples. Um, when you have this imbalance here, using the F1 score is a great way to know if your model is really doing well or not. Um, because it takes into account performance between classes as well, not just like accuracy, which is overall correct predictions. So if you look at this, if we look at the, what is it? Uh, actually, I think we could just do y dot mean to see the percent of uh, ones. Only 17% of the of the data is positively labeled. So if we do one minus that, this is the percent that's negatively labeled. Let's say we had a model that predicted zero for every single example. In that case, we'd have an 82.9% accuracy because we'd we'd we would basically get all the zeros right and all the ones wrong. But because there are so few ones, it barely affects our accuracy. We still have a nice big accuracy. However, our model is completely failing to do what we want. So that's where F1 score comes in and helps us out. Um, so now that we have our scores calculated, I'm going to create two separate lists up here. Call, I'll call one of them ax for accuracies, and it's going to be an empty list, and then f1s for f1 scores. That'll be an empty list too. Now done here, once we've calculated, uh, instead of calling it as variable, I'm just going to do ax.append this value. So we're basically adding the accuracy to our empty list, and we'll do the same thing for f1s. f1s.append this f1 value. Remove that. All right, and then once this has been done for all runs, for all five splits, then we should have five different values in each of these uh, lists. And we can get the final value by taking the mean across them. Like this. Uh, and then we can print them out. So accuracy uh, will display to two decimal places as a percentage and format using ACK times 100, since we, so we see it as a percent. And then we'll have our F1 score, and that will display to five decimal places and format with F1. All right, let's run this and see how it goes. Oh, I have a problem here. Let me just cancel that. OK. All right, I'll resume this when uh, the training is done. Oh, I ran into an error. Uh, the problem is this should be pause label, not just pause. OK, there we go. All right, the training is complete. Uh, and you can see we have pretty much terrible results. So <laughs> we have an 83% accuracy. But like I showed before, I think it's like 82% of the data is negatively labeled. 
Uh, so our model is doing really well when it comes to the positive class, but when it comes to the negative class, it's doing terribly, and that's given by the F1 score. We only have an F1 score of 0.25, when if we're doing uh, well, we should see an F1 score that resembles the accuracy. Um, so let's also, real quick, I'll just, I'm not going to visualize it in a big way, but I'm just going to do sklearn.metrics. Uh, I'm going to import the confusion matrix from this. Uh, just so I can get a quick glimpse of how the model is doing between classes. So I'm just, for, you know, for, I, I'd have to go ahead and recalculate it. I'm just going to get use the last uh, fold, which already has some YPred saved. So these are the predictions from the, the last fold, because the for loop registered them there. Um, so we can get the, predict, uh, the confusion matrix for this fold um, by taking YTest and YPred and checking that out. All right, and you can see... <coughs> Um, you know, we're not actually doing as badly as I thought. Uh, there is a good deal. This is the positive class here. So uh, these are our pre the ones we've predicted as positive. These are the ones we've predicted as negative. These are the actual negatives, and these are the actual positives. So you can see we got our true negatives. Not too bad, actually. However, you can see there's a terrible number of misclassifications here. This is saying that we predicted uh, a lot of positive classes as negative. So we're unable to detect when uh, an act when a positive class, which is the minority, uh, should be negative, which is sort of what we expected. So we're going to try to do some over, uh, so some class rebalancing, um, and hopefully get this F1 score up uh, closer to the accuracy. Now we may expect to see the accuracy drop when we do this, but it's still a better model because accuracy does not mean everything. Um, when you have a class balance like this, a high accuracy might mean your model's doing terribly. All right, so to do this, I'm just going to fit some some inform um, right before we train the model in here. I'm going to address class imbalance. So, how am I going to do this? There's a few ways we can do it. Let's look at why the value counts specifically. So we have this majority class and minority class. And they're just called that because this one has more examples and this has fewer. Um, there's two sort of methods we can apply here. One is uh, to reduce the number of examples in the majority class to equal that of the minority. And the other is to uh, basically synth synthesize data to increase the number of uh, minority classes to be equal to that of the majority. So the first is called undersampling because you're bringing the majority class down. The other is oversampling because you're bringing the minority class up. So we're going to use a combination of both of these. What we're going to do is find uh, the average between these two values, so something right in the middle, and we're going to pull uh, the majority down to that average and push the minority up to that average. And how are we going to do this? Um, I'm going to use one object from IMB Learn for this which is the random oversampler, which will automatically bring the minority class up to whatever the, uh, the majority is at. But before we use that, I want to bring the majority down to the uh, average um, ourselves. So let's pretend our, all of our data is Y. We would only do this on the train set, but let's just pretend we're using uh, Y as our train set here. If we take the mean of this, this is the average uh, value. So what it, it represents the, the middle between these two values, right? So that's the value we want to bring the majority class down to, and it's the value we want to bring the minority class up to. So what we're going to do is on a given k-fold run here, we're going to calculate this. Num samples is going to be this thing. It turned into an integer. And we're only going to do it for the train set. So this will be the number of samples we want to adjust to. And then we're going to get uh, the, okay, so, so the first thing we have to do is undersample. So we want to bring the majority class down to num samples, so that we only have num samples, examples in the majority class. So if we check uh, y equals 0, 0.0, this is the majority class. So every time we have a true, that's a member of the majority class, and every time we have a false, it's a member of the minority class. <clears throat> in this case, we just want the majority examples. So we're going to grab it like that uh, to use that true-false as an indexer. And now we have the indices, if we type dot .index. This is the indices of all the majority class uh, examples. So uh, what I'm going to do is sort of like save this in here. 
and I'm going to call it uh, majority indices. And just change y to y train. So once we have the majority indices, we're going to sample um, some of them to drop. So this is a little confusing, maybe. Let's look at this. Outside, I'll, I'll make our num samples. We just have to change that back to y. Uh, and if we look at what num, num samples is, it's 37,998. So this is the number of samples that we want from the majority class. We then calculate the majority indices right here, uh, except for all of y. And we take a look at it. Uh, so these are the indices of the majority classes. Now we want to sample this number of them. However, I'm going to do this a little backwards. I'm going to sample one, um, all the ones that we don't want so that we can drop those. Um, so we take y and sample. We could sample num samples, right? Um, however, we're getting the, the minority class in there also. So sort of what, what I want to do is we could do this, y sub majority indices dot sample. And this, this would sample the, this number. Uh, so the number we want, num samples, you can see, uh, majority class, uh, majority examples. However, um, now having to take these ones and go back and, you know, delete all of the majorities and replace them with this, it's just sort of a bit convoluted. Um, so I'm trying a more sort of hopefully elegant solution where instead of sampling num samples, I'm going to take the whole length of y and subtract num samples. And that would be the, the, the complement of num samples. All the ones, wow, huh, it's, it's the same, huh? Length of y is twice the number of num samples. Oh, sorry, just look at length of y. That's very interesting. Why is that? Oh, is it possible that I, I'm just I'm I'm trying to understand why uh, this is the same as num samples. Oh, right. Obviously, oh, it makes sense because if you add these up, that's the total length of y, and then divide by two, uh, then you get uh, half of y. Okay, um, so this is fine. I guess in this case we don't really have to do this. Um, I'm still going to do this though, so that we get the intuition. We're trying to sample all the ones that are not uh, the number we want, so we can drop them. And that will leave us with just the number that we'd like. So we're going to take this um, and put it down here. So just change this to y train and this to y train. And here, uh, so we're taking the majority samples, sampling uh, this number of them. And let's include a random state as well so that we can reproduce the results. Um, so that will, we'll call that samples to drop and we'll get the indices for that. Then we'll go and drop them, drop these samples from X train and Y train. All right. Um, now that effectively undersampled. So that, that now we've we've undersampled it because we get the majority indices we sample all the ones we don't want, we drop those, and we're left with all the ones we do want. Um, and if we run this now, uh, let's let's take this and put it up here, and then look at y train dot value counts. Uh, so now we've undersampled the majority down to twenty thousand. So this is a little different because uh, we're not using all of y here. So a little less than our uh, 37 we saw up here. Uh, but now the next job is to bring this one up to meet it. So to do that, we're going to use random oversampling, which is essentially the same thing I did here. What we do is just 
Uh, look, it's the opposite. We, we copy examples, duplicate rows, uh, and put them in. Um, now, there are better ways of oversampling, such as the SMOT algorithm, which uses some nearest neighbor tricks to create new synthetic data. Um, but for this, we're just going to use uh, random oversampling because I have categoricals and that's going to cause problems uh, with the nearest neighbors and I have to go into the whole thing to try to address that. So we're just going to do random oversampling. We're going to create our oversampler and this is our random oversampler from IMB Learn or Imbalanced Learn. Give that a random state as well. Uh, and then all we have to do is X train and Y train is now going to be oversampler dot fit resample on X train Y train and that will do it for us so everything we did here uh, condensed into one line the only reason I didn't use uh, IMB learns random under sampler for this part uh, is because I I didn't see how there was a way to uh, manually choose the number of, of samples you want uh, to bring it down to all right so we run this um, and we should have a, a perfectly balanced uh, class. We run that, let's put it up here. Run this and then look at the value counts. You can see we now, wait a minute, did I do this right? That shouldn't, that shouldn't be happening, right? We should have 20,000 of both. Okay. Um, Let's see this. We're going to recreate Y train. I'm just going in, this is annoying, I know. I'm just trying to recreate the train and test set so we can look at this again. Okay, all right. So it's just a glitch. Uh, it is working properly. 20,000 and 20,000. So this has addressed the class imbalance. And now what we're going to do is go and uh, run this one more time. And before, I think we got an accuracy of 83% and an F1 score of 0.25. So we're going to see if we can beat that uh, by now having adjusted the class imbalance. So I'll run that, and we'll take a look when it's done. All right, um, we've completed training. And you can see we actually beat it by quite a bit. Uh, our accuracy has gone down to 76%, but our F1 score has risen to a nice 0.43, which is a lot better than the 0.25 we were getting before. Um, so these are always imperfect fixes. It's, it's impossible to perfectly fix a class imbalance because there is redundant information. Um, and even if you use a nice oversampling technique like SMOTE, uh, in the end, um, either you're losing out on information by, uh, sorry, what I mean is with SMOT, uh, you're generating synthetic information sort of already from the information you have. So the only real way to address a class imbalance is to go out and get new data. <coughs> However, there are a lot of nice tricks you can do to try to work with it if you can't do that. Um, and the last thing I want to try here before we end is to go and include that other column, release number, as a categorical feature. So all we have to do is put that in here. And now we'll one-hot encode both these columns. Uh, and we'll try this one last time to see if we get better results. I'm just going to save those there so we can compare. And I'll run this and see how it goes. OK, uh, actually we're into an error here. It's a bit of an annoying error. Uh, basically what happened is um, there's a few, uh, when we one-hot encoded it, uh, and then we did you can see the error is being thrown by the predict on the test set. So what happened is when we did this split with the k-fold, there were some examples in the test set that are not present in the train set. Um, and that will throw an error because the one-hot encoder was not uh, doesn't know how to handle these these categories which were not present on the data it was trained in uh, trained on. So to address this, we could go up here and include handle unknown equals ignore. However, uh, this won't work because you can't specify both of these arguments. I'm not exactly sure the reason why, but it doesn't let you use both at the same time. So what we're going to have to do is create a separate one-hot encoder. 
I'll call this binary transformer. And then we'll do another one over here, which will be nominal transformer. And this one will, instead of drop, will have handle unknown equals ignore. Uh, and then in our preprocessor, we're going to preprocess twice. First, we're going to use the binary on marketing type. So this will be our binary transformer. And that we'll call binary. And then we'll do it again for the nominal. This is our nominal transformer. Uh, and this one we're going to use on the release number column. OK, uh, that should be good. Let's run this uh, and then try it one more time. All right, training is done. And we did get a bit of a performance boost from that. Uh, both the accuracy and F1 score went up here, uh, which means it actually is better to one hot encode this uh, feature rather than keep it as ordinal. All right, uh, and that will sum up today's video. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content and leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.